All right, welcome. Thanks for tuning back in. I'm super excited to have Kyler back on here again. We're going to be talking a lot about um, the mental side of training. We've talked a lot about uh, the physical fitness aspect. We've talked about you know the nutrition aspect. We're going to talk about a little bit more of the mental side today. So Kyler is a um, personal trainer and um, athletic trainer from uh, Montana. And uh, Kyler, uh, where can people find you if they're interested in talking about sports performance? Yeah, you can find me. I work at a uh, gym in Kalispell, Montana uh, called, uh, I work for the competitive edge department for myself, for my personal business, Blades Athletic Performance Academy. You can find me on, um, on the internet, www.bladesapa.com or all my social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, and Snapchat at Blades APA. Badass. Sweet. And I'm a fat loss specialist. So if you're looking for losing more fat, getting stronger, you can always go to fitnesstrainerjohn.com or just find me on Facebook or Instagram at uh, mytrainerjohn. So that's super simple. And I'll try to keep it as, as plain and as very basic as possible. So um, Kyler, why don't we start off by uh, kind of diving into, you know, goal reaching and how to even come up with a goal um, where do you start? How do you put together a goal that's actually going to be attainable and um, and uh, something that you can actually strive to shoot for? Let's start there. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we, we talk about the acronym SMART goals, mm. you know, um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And so we want our goals to be um, very measurable and specific, not this general, oh, I want to lose weight. Oh, I want to, I want to be healthier. It has to be a specific goal. Um, let's put, we put a number to it so it is measurable, saying, yes, you accomplished it, or no, you didn't quite accomplish it. Um, again, we want it to be in the realm of possibility, not saying I want to lose 50 pounds in the next month. That's not really um, realistic. And then, and then we set a date. We set a date that we accomplish it by or a date we, we might not accomplish it by. And the thing with goals – are they're more fluid than they are solid. You know, it's not the end of the world if you do not accomplish that specific goal. There's small pivots you do to adjust the goal um, to fit your current situation. So for myself, one of my most recent goals um, as far as training was I wanted to get back up to, you know, I wanted to accomplish a 300-pound squat because I had always been um, really tight in my hips. I never was able to do that due to some flexibility issues. Um, get up to a 250 pound hang clean and a 300 pound bench press. Unfortunately, I rolled my ankle the worst I've ever done it before in my life. I've been on the DL for about eight weeks. I ran for the first time earlier this week. And so I had to adjust and pivot that goal into something where now it's, I'm trying to get back to where I can play basketball in about two weeks from now. And so by doing that, I have been, um, at the end of all my lifting sessions, I've been doing a lot of ankle rehab, and so I can get back to playing basketball by June 14th. That was the day I wanted to start playing again. And so just specific goals like that, I think, is, is what we have to do. And like my little story, you can pivot and adjust them as you go because life happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the last thing you just said there is what I want to touch on because – in the realm of which I deal with, I deal with, you know, um, I deal with clients and potential clients who have fat loss goals of anywhere between 20 to sometimes 150 pounds. And they, it's very common to see someone walk in my, in my door with this impression that um, now is the only time that I'm going to be able to accomplish it. But every time I try, uh, something always gets in the way, right? And uh, I always feel like I have to start over because you know, my sister always comes in town and, and I get super busy and I fall off or work gets busy and then I fall off. And there's this happy balance that we have to find in our lifestyles to where you can rev up those fitness goals, keep into a position that you're comfortable with so you can maintain consistency when you're going through those busier schedules. And so I like that little, that little point that you made at the end. And the other point that I think is really important as is – Yes, goals are fluid, so they change even sometimes during in the you know in the middle, right? You're halfway to that goal and then something happens, like you get hurt, right? So you can either push the time frame back, the um the goal can shift and the goal can change slightly, uh things like that. So 
you know, writing down a goal isn't an all or nothing kind of situation. It's allowed to fluctuate. You're allowed to manipulate it as you go because, you know, right now you might care about losing 50 pounds, but you get 20 pounds lighter and you're happy with where you're at. Now you want to start getting stronger and start learning how to do pull-ups. You're allowed to try to, 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 to start to manipulate that goal a little bit. It is allowed. Yeah. You know, rule book. Yeah. And I think having, we can't just have this one huge goal of losing 150 pounds or, um, you know, I have people that for, for myself, I deal with mainly, uh, younger, you know, a lot of times younger athletes that want to get to the next level in their sport. So attaining a college scholarship, like that's a big goal and that's out there. So what are the steps in order to get there? So we set these little goals along the way and have this big one in mind at all times. Mm -hmm. So always for my clients, we try to have, a short, medium, and long-term goal. Mm -hmm. You know, in the next weeks, in the next three months, in the next six months to a year to whatever it might be. So, and those are always adjusting and changing as life happens, like you said. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's risky to only focus on the big one, especially for someone who's trying to lose a hundred pounds. You know, um, if, assuming that we're losing a pound to two pounds a week, that's going to take you anywhere between two two plus years, sometimes a little bit less if you're really kicking ass. But, you know, two years is pretty standard at a pound a week, right? 52 weeks in a year, you want to lose 100 pounds, that's 104 weeks. So uh, if you focus on that large goal the entire time, the moment you stop seeing a pound a week, that discouragement, that anxiety, um, the pressure is now on, right, to stay within that time frame. And so it's much easier to, to break it down into little chunks, understanding that we're in this for the long haul for two years, right? Exactly. Understanding that it, it can fluctuate. You know, it's, a, it's okay to do two and a half years. It's okay. If, it's even better if you did it in a year and a half. But focusing on something that's a year and a half away is really hard to stay motivated towards. Yep. You know, something that can happen in the next six months, it's a lot easier. Right. And so an exercise that I like to do uh, with my clients is, you know, we have these different goals written down and we'll talk a little bit more about the power of writing your goals down a little bit later, but we write down all these goals. Okay. And then we, we ask, what are the steps in order to take these goals? Because we want to be process oriented. We don't want to be goal oriented. So we write down all the, you know, like three steps that are, are needed to accomplish this goal that's above these three steps. From there, we, we black out the goal up top and write habit next to those three steps because those three things need to become a habit and that's how we become process oriented instead of goal oriented and those will eventually lead toward our big, big picture goal. Exactly, someone who's goal oriented um, typically doesn't even reach that goal because they forget that in order to accomplish it, you have to do the day-to-day -day requirements and they get so overwhelmed with that, that overarching goal that they forget all about the day-to-day -day requirements. And so being, being process oriented is far more crucial because you need to do those things every day in order for you to reach that goal anyway. So you might as well not, not, not so much be obsessed, but be diligent with those, with those day-to-day -day goals um, and yeah, those and processes. Absolutely. We talk about, um, you know, you and I are both college graduates. If we jumped in or, you know, even high school kids, if they're just thinking about, okay, I got to graduate, I got to get this diploma, you know, that's the only thing I'm focused on. You're not going to get there because you have to focus on the little things, the homework every day the studying for these tests that are coming up, these little steps get you to that big place. But if you only focus on the diploma, that's when you get frustrated. And that's why you see so many college kids drop out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, in the, and in the process, that's when you feel like college takes forever because right. all you're doing is focusing on something that's supposed to happen five years from now. You know what I mean? And it's pretty common when you're like, if, if you're, if you're in a job, and you are going on a cruise in, in like two months, the last three weeks before your cruise feels like a year because all you're doing is thinking about this cruise and how much more fun it's going to be than sitting in your dead end job. And so, you know, it's the same thing. It's, the, it's very congruent. It's very synergistic. I mean, you're, you're, you're either focusing on the day-to-day -day habitual habits that you have to have 
in order for you to accomplish the goal or you're thinking about the long, long, long journey ahead of you and that's very overwhelming. So um, especially if it's something that's very drastic, you know, as an athlete, they're, most athletes are process oriented because they've been growing up in that in that atmosphere a long time. But for someone who's never played sport and nobody who's ever been competitive before, it's, it's a very new realm for them. And so um, that's definitely something I definitely encourage you to do is do exactly what Kyler says and to do a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time frame. You know, and realistic is heavily dependent on what you find your time frame to be you know Kyler you mentioned you can't lose 50 pounds in two months so if you come to me with a goal of saying I want to lose 50 pounds in two months that time frame doesn't make the goal realistic so we need to extend the time frame and by extending the time frame it becomes realistic and then we can we have something to build off of so exactly. it's very very important as well so I would ask you for someone who has been in sport or someone who hasn't been in sport, this is, you know, the same thing. Being process oriented requires you to be motivated every day. So what do you, what strategies do you use to keep your clients motivated or yourself motivated? So um, I'll start with me first. I have in my, uh, cause this is my office in my, and I have a home office. So in my living room, in my house, I have a, huge, huge whiteboard. It takes up about half my wall and I write down everything I want, not in, not only in fitness, but in life, money, trips, vacations, everything is on there. Pictures, words, you can, you name it, it's on there. And so I have this overarching goal board also in my gym. And whenever someone signs on for with me as a, as a, as a, uh, as a client, um, we write those goals down and they look at it every day that they're in there. They can see it. They can see themselves getting closer to it. They can see themselves understanding that they're doing the little things to get there or vice versa. They're not doing the little things to get there. Um, I encourage people to write sticky notes throughout their house of saying, you know, positive reinforcement, positive self-talk. Um, because that's really the thing that I see most of the time with my clients is that there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of people in their lives that have told them that they can't do it, that they're overweight, that they're, you know, they're unhealthy, that they'll die early, you know, doctors, medication, they're probably on medication, they probably have high anxiety and depressed and things like that. They're dealing with a lot of internal demons. And maybe it's been a year, sometimes never, that someone says that you can actually accomplish it if you believe that you can accomplish it and then give them props when they do something right. Some people have never even had that before. So making sure that there's steps in place for them to have positive reinforcement and teaching them how to have positive self-talk and getting rid of some of those limiting belief systems is probably the number one thing. Because if the mind isn't right, you know, the abs start in the kitchen, the abs start in, in your head. So if your mind's not right, if you're talking bad about yourself, if you're thinking negative thoughts about the goal, if you don't believe that you can accomplish the goal, even though you have the goal, because you don't believe that it's attainable, you're not gonna you're not gonna do the processes, you're not gonna do the day to day stuff that's gonna get you there anyways, because you don't really believe that it's gonna work. So yeah, gotta believe it to achieve it, man. Uh, quick question: Have you ever read or watched the movie called The Secret? Because oh yeah, sound, yeah, have you have? Oh yeah. It's it, yeah, so have I, and that's kind of where a lot of the stuff, the the positivity, the positive mindset, and they call that in the movie uh, the vision board, and mm -hmm. I think it's important to always have that as well. Absolutely, it's 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 huge, and the the thing that I, uh, the missing link I think sometimes is people get this uh, this misunderstanding that if I just think it, it's going to happen, which is not true. If you think it, it puts you into a position where you can take action to make it happen. So I think that it's a two-step process um, in order to achieve a goal. You have to believe that you can accomplish it, right? So that's, the, that's where the understanding of thoughts become things. There's some truth to that. But really believing that you can accomplish it puts you into a position where you're willing to put the action into place for you to actually accomplish it. So, you know, positive self-talk, positive reinforcement, and getting rid of your limiting belief systems creates the opportunity to create action and action becomes things. So I think it's a two-step process. And yeah. The Secret is a very good movie. I think sometimes that it just, it misses that little step of action, right? Mm -hmm. just, 
just because you believe you're going to uh, obtain this $10,000 necklace in the shop next to you doesn't mean you're actually going to attain it. You actually have to put action into place, make more money, save money, and then you can get it. But, you know, um, I think it's a two-step process. And so, yes, the vision board is huge. The vision board is very, very important. And I think talking about positives, uh, positive self-talk is, is really important. So all the goals that I set with my clients, we put them into a sentence form and it starts with, I will achieve. It's not saying, well, I want to have this goal. No, it starts with, I will achieve. And then whatever your goal is. And then we talk about how, so that's kind of the process of writing a goal down. There's a little bit that goes into it. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that we're having this conversation because I just had this conversation with, um, with a client of mine yesterday. Uh, she struggles with consistency, you know, following her nutrition, eating healthier, eating a little less, and then coming in to see me. You know, she took two and a half weeks off. And so she came in yesterday very frustrated because she, uh, she lost the ability to do a lunge as well as she was doing about a month ago. She kind of regressed a little bit. And that happens if you're fluctuating with your consistency level. And so we sat down, we talked about it, and we started talking about all the stuff that we're talking about now. And uh, she's a drug and alcohol counselor. And she goes, you know what? Everything you're saying to me is what I tell my clients. And I was like, it's because, you know, it's, I'm not reinventing the wheel, but sometimes, um, sometimes he, even even I need to hear it, right? Sometimes we don't know that we're doing these things because we only see us how we see us, right? We don't see, I don't see me how you see me. I only understand me based off of what I think about me. And so sometimes it kind of goes over our head and sometimes we just need that friendly reminder of, hey, kick it back in gear. You know, health and fitness is very, very similar to something they would probably talk to somebody who has an addiction to gambling, right? It's all mental. It's all um, dedication to a new craft and being committed to achieving this goal. The only difference is the people you deal with, they're trying to quit gambling and people that I deal with, we're trying to get healthier by eating less, you know, unhealthy foods, having more quality foods and moving more, you know, but yeah, the, the, the idea and is so, similar. So someone who, you know, has regressed that's a tough thing for a trainer to swallow and a tough thing for a client to swallow mm -hmm. uh, the one thing i would ask them is or i don't know if you did ask this is your goal big enough to motivate you to you know not regress i mean like it has to be this if, if it's not that important to you maybe the gym's not the right place for you mm -hmm. you know how bad do you want it Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to sometimes. Exactly. And I have that, I have that conversation a lot. Um, some multiple, some with, some with clients multiple times. Um, and it, it comes down to, I view it as it's not the goal. It's not the fact that the goal is not important to them. It's the fact that they lose sight on the reason why they're trying to do it in the first place. You know, um, I get a lot of clients who come in, um, you know, uh, this one gentleman that I just met with and he just hopped on board with my nutrition programming is he came in, he wanted to lose 150 pounds. And so we sat for about two, two and a half hours at my whiteboard trying to figure out why he wanted to lose 150 pounds. Um, he, you know, he gave me, I want to feel better. Well, why is that important to you? I want to be able to move better. Well, why do you care? You know, what's the, what's the difference? What's the value there? And we finally just kept digging and digging and we came up to this understanding that he actually, he, yes, he wanted to move better. Yes. He wanted to feel healthier, but really what he really wanted was he didn't want to die alone. He's, he's by himself. He lives in a one bedroom apartment. He hasn't had a, um, a companion for 30 years and his confidence is so, so low that um, he can't bring himself to approach anybody. That's what he really wants is to, he wants to have more confidence and to be able to find somebody to spend the last 30 years with. And I was like, that is what you need to hold on to. And the moment that you lose sight of that, then the inconsistency starts, right? The reason why you're here is because of that, not because you want to feel better, not because you want to look good in that bikini, Mrs. Jones, it's because you want to be able to be around for your, your grandkids because you have a grandkid on the way. And right now you can't get off the floor. Right. 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 Yeah. So 
That's an awesome story, John. Uh, what do you do to quantify something like confidence? How do you do that? That's a good question because confidence is, is like, um, it's a real thing. I see it in my clients all the time. Um, you know, maybe it might be for that gentleman's situation, something like, Hey, I'm going to do all this work in the gym, feel more confident. And I'm going to talk to three new people a week or something like that. That's how we try to, that's where it comes back to the smart goals measurable. Did you talk to th three new people this week? Did you not talk to three new people this week? You know, um, going to lunch with someone you've never gone to lunch with. I, I don't know what it might be as far as confidence, but sure. that's how, that's the steps. That's the, you know, the next steps you have to take in order to make a goal measurable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And for that, for that gentleman, yeah, it would be something along those lines. It would be, you know, Hey, did you talk to somebody you've never met before? Or, um, you know, uh, and then as he gets stronger with that, gets more confident with that, gets more comfortable talking to strangers, talking to people he doesn't know. Hey, did you talk to somebody of the opposite sex, but, you know, today? Yeah, definitely. And just um, working on those communication skills. And for him, that's a big portion of it is his communication skills. Um, or there, he's a little out of practice, you know what I mean? And so getting those communication skills back into place is a big deal. So, and that's part of my job, right? I have a responsibility. I feel like to communicate a lot with him and to, you know, put him in situations that are challenging for him that he's ready for, obviously, but to put him in situations that are going to challenge those communication skills and then be there for him to help him walk through it and help him get better at the things maybe he didn't do so great at. That's my job, even though he's there to help, you know, for me to help him with his nutrition and keep him accountable, help him lose weight. I have a, I have an obligation to do the rest. Right. Right. Yeah. If you can survive a workout with John, you can go talk to girls. That's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So switching gears a little bit, John, I'd like, I like to uh, ask a lot of people. This is, um, what would be your most successful life event that you've achieved as far as goal setting what's something you really set out to achieve that you accomplished you know i have a lot of people saying it might be um this new experience i have, I have one client that's branching out of her comfort zone and becoming a traveling nurse it's awesome she achieved this dream of hers and she's in the process of doing that i have other people that say hey this master's degree that i'm working toward i got my bachelor's degree i'm a couple years in I'm going for my master's, you know, things like that. Um, I want to hear your take and then I'll have, I'll go after you. Um, I think I probably have, two, I probably have two probably. Um, the, the number one would, would definitely be um, creating a very successful um, fitness and fat loss company um, and being uh, what I would hope to my clients. You might want to ask them, uh, but uh, um, being a relatively good and, uh, and supportive um, and knowledgeable coach and consultant for them because um, that's really what I am, right? I'm a consultant and a coach. Um, I'm not just a trainer that sits at the, at the gym and helps you work out, right? I do, I do everything for you. So um, I think that would be the biggest successful uh, goal that I've accomplished, especially in the, in the relative near future, right? Um, but, uh, or relatively uh, past. Um, but um, other than that, it would definitely be my college career. Baseball um, would probably be the second one. Um, I was not overly talented. I was not a very talented baseball player. I just uh, I I was very diligent. I was hard nosed and stubborn when it came to defeat. Um, I didn't like to lose, and so I found ways to scrap by. So I would go to the go to the baseball field an hour before and hit, and then I would stay two hours after and I would continue to hit. So if you know anything about baseball, the last thing that you want to be doing in the middle of December is being outside at nine o'clock at night, hitting tea, you know, hitting baseballs off the tee, uh, cause it's 25 degrees. And, uh, I was taking 30 credits, um, cause I ended up getting four or five degrees. And so I was taking 30 credits at the same time and I was playing baseball um, trying to find my way through that. So I would be hitting at nine o'clock at night, go home, do three, four, five hours of studying, wake up at five o'clock and go to my first class because I was taking so many credits. And so 
that was probably my 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 second biggest one getting um a good chunk of awards from from baseball especially at the community college and then the four-year level unfortunately just got a little hurt towards the end and i couldn't play anymore but that would probably be the second one what about you nice um yeah it would be my uh the baseball career also and as you know baseball is a grinder sport man it's not for the pain of heart for sure it's a grind brutal um, a little background, I came from a small town in Montana that doesn't have high school baseball. We had Legion baseball, which is a couple towns combined to make a team. And so, and there's no real colleges that play baseball around here. There's one nine hours away on the other side of Montana. And then there's some in Washington that were close by. So out of high school, I had this idea of, uh, of playing college baseball. Well, I mean, I had it during high school and I worked my butt off in high school to to get to the point where I was in the position to play college baseball. Went down to California Lutheran University, small D3 school. They actually just won the Division III World Series this year. Hey, uh, awesome. Uh, Went down there for a year. It was a cool experience coming from a small town and then down close to L.A. It was kind of like a foreign exchange opportunity. It was so expensive, though, I, I, I couldn't keep affording it. And so I transferred to a junior college, Wenatchee Valley College, had an awesome year there, my sophomore season, um, and was going to get offered a scholarship from Central Washington. Um, we had been in talks with the coach of them getting a package together, and then I committed to the school, and they decided to give the package elsewhere to p- their pitching staff. And so I said, well, okay, that's all right. You know, I have a good academic scholarship. I'll come there. Um, and the first day of tryouts, I get there, and there's like 130 kids trying out and eight second basemen, which is what I played. Uh, and so that was kind of tough. I did get cut off that team. I redshirted. I practiced with them. I didn't travel. Um, you know, they, they cut it down to 30-something guys or something like that. But I, I didn't travel. I redshirted that year. And it was, it was a really tough thing for me. You know, it was, do I hang my cleats up now? Am I done with baseball? This has been such a big part of my life what I don't feel like I'm done. What do I do? And so I watched that movie. We talked about the secret. And at that time I was uh, not playing baseball, but I was working my butt off in the gym. And like you said, you know, hitting at nine o'clock at night uh, with another buddy who I roped into helping me out and hitting with them all the time. And so I would uh, watch this movie, the secret. And I wrote down this goal this was my, my one big goal. I put it at the top. It was, I want to be a captain on a college baseball team. Mind you, this was at a time where I was cut. I was a, you know, I had already finished. This was three years into college. I was cut from a team. I was not playing baseball. I didn't even know what school I was going to, but I had this big goal. And so I go play summer ball. I meet you in Portland and uh, I, I put, I kept this piece of paper and I put it right above my light switch. It had all these different goals, but at the top, it was become a captain on a college baseball team. And so I saw it every time I woke up, I flipped the light switch on. I saw that goal. Every time I went to bed, I flipped the lights off and I saw that goal. Go through my summer. I uh, get a call from Pacific Lutheran University, end up committing there, small D3 school. First year, I didn't have a whole lot of that bats, had a really awesome team. Um, Worked my butt off there, just had an awesome time. And then my senior season came around, fall fall tryouts, Went well. Uh, it was a good time. And the coach called, you know, a small group of us into his office asking us to be on what we call the leadership squad, which is essentially our captain's team. And it was at that moment I realized, you know, it kind of hit me a little, little while after I left that office. But I was like, holy cow. Like, from where I was to, to where I am now, I've accomplished what I set out to do. Mm-hmm. I was a captain on a college baseball team and that's something I'll, I'll hold forever and you can't take away from me. So um, it, it just goes to show the power of writing goals down and having things um, that you're striving towards is, is, you know, immensely powerful. The power of the mind is, is crazy beyond our, beyond our control even a little bit. So it's huge. that's kind of my big, big story on, on goal setting and, and goal achieving and of course I have some now and it's become a habit of mine since I've, since I've done that. And so um, I like to share that with people. It, it means a lot to me. 
Absolutely. No, I think that's great, man. And I can definitely, I can definitely relate to you. I mean, I redshirted myself. Um, I was a cross country runner in high school. So um, I was very underweight. I was six foot tall when I went into my freshman year and I was 140 pounds. So I was a little guy. And so (laughs) brutal, man. So I redshirted because I, I couldn't, I didn't have enough strength. I was extremely fast didn't have enough strength. And so uh, I had to spend that year getting better um, and becoming a better overall player and getting stronger. So I had a lot of work to do. I had to put on you know, 20 pounds of muscle by the, by the time that year was over. So I hired a trainer myself um, because I had to. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. It was either not play or, or get a trainer. And, uh, and yeah, and, and then the rest is history. I mean, I, I, I feel you, man. I was not – I was not the greatest baseball player on the planet. You ask Brian Donahue, he'll tell you. I mean, he told – when I graduated, he goes uh, in, in front of everybody during the, um, during the ceremony at the end when they acknowledge all the, all the stuff and we're doing awards and things like that. And he goes, uh, John Walborn, uh, I mean, i got to be honest with you, John. Yeah, you weren't the, you weren't the, the best baseball player <laughs> showing up here. And I was like <laughs> – front of all the parents and I'm like gosh Dono you really uh really know how to how to pick the right words but (laughs) (laughs) but hey I play with you man you were a grinder you 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 were a grinder and you take that off the field you take that into life and I think that's really important yep yep and I just um I just decided that I was never going to be the most talented player but I was going to earn everything that I that I that I achieved and so I walked out of uh, out of the community college level with a lot of uh a lot of player of the year awards and a lot of um uh, outfield of the year awards and stuff like that um, went to the four-year university played and played NAIA ball um, and then got hurt again but uh, and had to leave but um, you know I have I have an athlete that I'm coaching I'm, I'm also coaching baseball right now a young athlete that I'm coaching right now who loves to run also and you know it's getting up to 80 85 90 degrees out here practicing all the time but he likes to run on top of that but his goal is to to gain 30 pounds so, Clayton, if you're watching this, listen to, listen to John. Listen to John, okay? <laughs> he, uh, he's been through it. He's done it. Um, so what, what do you give that, that kid advice? You know, do you cut – you know, I've kind of advised him to cut the running down from seven days a week to maybe, maybe a couple days a week because he's a catcher. He always has the catcher's gear on too. Uh, uh, and then up in his calories, man, up in it big time. That's you, kind of- yeah, you have a job to do when it comes to your cal- caloric intake, man. If you want to keep running at that tempo, I mean, you're looking at a ton of calories. And if you can't eat it, then you need to give up something. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just math. And so um, if you're doing seven days a week, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd encourage you. If baseball is what you want to do. You're going to have to back off the running temporarily for a little bit. Um, yep. You and kids have such high motors, man. Kids have such high motors <laughs> that they just don't want to stop. They just want to keep going. And we've both been there. Yeah. We didn't know what to do. But yep. you and I hopefully are here to spread the word of, of what to do. What mm-hmm. you know, we're just here to help people. And so we're here to communicate that. What exactly do we need to do um, in order for you to accomplish your goals? And it starts with with in the head and with a piece of paper and a pencil. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I decided that when I went to college that I wanted to do something with, uh, with health and fitness. I mean, you know, owning a company and doing, running the whole show and doing the whole thing on your own and starting from scratch with no income and having a family to support. I have another half that lives in my house that I, you know, she deserves to, to be taken care of. You know, there's a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, you're just trying, you're f- trying to find your way. And so, if, if, if you're not dedicated to, to growing a company from zero and making sure that you can provide for your family and that you can actually do what you are setting out to do, which is to help as many people as you possibly can, um, you know, if you're not really hell bent on making that happen, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't half ass anything you do. So if this, if this kid, um, you know, really wants to play baseball, then you might want to back out of the running just a little bit or change the style of what you run you know, instead of doing long distance, work on your sprint intervals, work on, 
you know, burst and speed and agility still get that fix of the, of the, of the running. It's just a different style. And that was something that I had to learn and I was very resilient against it. I loved long runs. We ran uh, four miles every Monday for baseball and I kicked everybody's ass doing it. <laughs> and, yes. um, but it wasn't helping me get stronger. It wasn't helping me gain more muscle mass and get heavier because I was burning so much stuff off. So I finally had to come to that realization that I needed to get less good at running and get better at being stronger and being a better baseball player. And so I switched to sprint work and switched to, uh, to interval training and switched to agility work, helped my baseball career a lot more, it helped me get stronger and stay lean so I wasn't gaining a bunch of garbage weight. Um, and I still got my fix in and I got really good at, uh, at sprints instead. So, you know, if you're okay with kind of switching your method, maybe go with that route, but dive all in. Right. If you're going to play baseball, dive in and, and, mm -hmm. and whatever, whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to do, dive all in. Absolutely. And that includes fat loss goals, ladies and yes, gentlemen, yes. <laughs> that includes fat loss goals. Go all in and uh, commit. Don't commit to me. Commit to yourself that you're going to accomplish this stuff. So I'm just, I'm just the coach. I'm the consultant that's going to keep you accountable but you know, you're not doing this goal for me. I'm going to love you guys no matter what, whether you're heavy, light, fit, not fit. I don't care. I want you to see, see this through because I care about you. And if you care about this, I'm going to dive in and this is my goal just as much as it is yours. So do this for you. Don't worry about letting me down. Don't worry. Don't worry about me judging you. I'm doing this because I'm in your corner and I'm your coach and your consultant because I want to see you succeed. So, Yep. Well said. Well said. Um, let's wrap this up, John. Uh, people watching, where can they find you again? Yeah, if you want to find out more about what I do, the fat loss, uh, fat loss programs that I offer um, in my consulting, you can go to fitnesstrainerjohn.com and you can shoot me a phone call, shoot me an email, or, or check out my blogs. You can also find me on social media at mytrainerjohn. What about you? Yep. And I am at www.bladesapa.com. You can check out my blog on there. Um, and also just get in touch with me on, the, on there. There's a contact, um, a contact slide on there that we can uh, get in touch. And then social media at Blades APA, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. Perfect. Awesome. We'll do this again. Um, and uh, for those listening, for those watching later, stay tuned. Thanks, Kyler, for having me on here. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm.